hey, if we're going to be skittering through the steel hallways of the Citadel Station, we should probably fuel up with a delicious bowl of Magic Spoon, who's sponsoring today's video. If you're an up-and-coming skeleton-based computer hacker like me, you're going to need more protein, less sugar, and 4 to 5 net grams of carbs per serving if you're going to stay one step ahead. While I've enjoyed lots of their past cereal flavors, it's the bars, chocolate peanut butter or cookies and cream, which really keep me going whenever I'm trying to outrun an overbearing computer program. Some of you may know I'm a cereal fiend in general, and Magic Spoon's been a great choice for me for all those midnight snacking urges. They've also been excellent in helping the show out, so if you'd like $5 off the custom cereal bundle of your choice, enter the code McMuscles at checkout, scan the QR code you see here, or go to magicspoon.com slash McMuscles to start your own cereal adventure today. Thanks again to Magic Spoon for all the support. Without further ado, let's start the show. Welcome once again, <coughs> Insect, to another cyberspacing and Citadel Raisin episode of What Happened, the show that hacks into the database of pop culture history to uncover the most arduous development stories. And this week's story, much like our last one, covers another video game that had a torturously long development cycle, but eventually saw the light of day, or more accurately, the unfeeling abyss of space. It's a tale that spans eight years, multiple engines, and several instances of starting again from scratch, all in the pursuit of reintroducing one of the most chilling fictional antagonists the world has ever known. So grab your audio logs and any spare severed heads as I answer the question, what happened to the System Shock remake? Welcome home. You can't properly break down the history of this particular game without simultaneously breaking down the history of its developer, Night Dive Studios. While they may be best known for their excellent re-releases and remasters of fan-favorite games like Blood, Turok, Shadow Man, Doom 64, Quake, Power Slave, and the upcoming and incredibly ludicrous Rise of the Triad, the company only came to exist because of System Shock. In 2010, well before they had ever found a night dive, two burnt-out video game artists, Steven and then girlfriend but now wife Alex Kick, were on a long sabbatical traveling throughout Mexico to hopefully recharge their batteries. During a torrential downpour in Guatemala, Steven opened up his laptop to play some games he had installed before they had left on their journey, but realized he had forgotten System Shock 2. Hooking up to his hostel's Wi-Fi and logging on to GOG, he was shocked to learn it wasn't available, despite it being one of the service's most requested games. This then sent him on another very different journey to find out why System Shock wasn't playable on modern PCs and depending on that answer to hopefully make it a reality. Steven's internet sleuthing as to who owned the rights to the franchise led him to an article written by Jared Newman on G4TV.com titled The Lost History of System Shock. The piece revealed that a Midwest-based company by the name of Star Insurance owned it outright, and thus decided to contact their lawyer, George Borkowski, to inquire where System Shock currently stood, which as it turns out, was in an interesting position. I spoke to Mr. Kick directly for this episode, where he explained to me how this was the start of an early string of lucky breaks. To my surprise, he, George, wrote me back and asked if I wanted to make System Shock 3. I think at this point I had a few thousand dollars to my name and was more or less sequestered in the jungle, but I replied with an idea. What I'd like to do is make System Shock and its sequel playable again, an idea they hadn't heard yet. I would find out years later that my timing couldn't have been better. A week or two prior, Electronic Arts had let their trademark rights for System Shock expire and Star had just applied for it. However, in order to claim ownership, Star had to find a way to prove they were commercializing the trademark. What better way than by re-releasing and selling the existing games? Aside from one very brief attempt at a System Shock 3 that eventually turned into Dead Space, yeah that was a thing, check out this video here, EA never did anything with the franchise and, as Steven said, eventually let their trademark lapse. So the only thing Star Insurance asked for from Mr. and Mrs. Kick was to raise a significant amount of capital to pay for the licensing fees and to set up their own company from scratch, uh, something neither had any experience with. 
So after a lot of DIYing and asking friends and family to help invest, they cut a check, gave it to Star Insurance, and got to work. Which is something I would be saying to you if they didn't also have to prove to GOG that they now own the license to System Shock. As we all know, in the history of the world, 99% of the time, opening up an online support ticket has never actually done anything ever, but this just so happened to fall into that 1% of the time that it did. Thankfully, I got a reply soon after. The email I received was part of a longer thread. I read through it and it included someone from their marketing team discussing my claim with the head honcho. He's probably full of shit, but investigate just to make sure it read. So with the green light from every possible party, it was finally time for the arduous process of painstakingly taking every line of code from System Shock 2 and up uh, there we are! In yet another early example of incredibly good luck, most of the work had already been done somewhere else. During those initial negotiations with Star, an anonymous modder had actually converted System Shock 2 to modern rigs independently and with minimal compatibility or performance issues. Steven made it very clear to the administration at GOG that the version of the game he was submitting to them for testing was made by this anonymous modder, but GOG unfortunately attributed the porting work to their tech ninjas, which took a little smoothing over with the System Shock community. Within a month of the port being available though, it had generated $700,000, which helped establish Night Dive, a name Steven and Alex had come up with due to their mutual love of diving, and to hire a number of talented off-site employees who would all strive to bring other classic games to modern setups and eventually consoles. With a relatively simple conversion performing so well and the fact that they now had the publishing license, it made perfect sense to go one step further with a full remake of the original 1994 System Shock that had started it all. And while Night Dive had caught a number of lucky breaks up to that point, much like the Citadel space station itself, you never knew what was around the next corner and when that luck would eventually end. I asked Stephen Kick why they decided to turn towards Kickstarter to help fund a System Shock remake in lieu of other options, and his answer isn't too surprising. The main reason we used crowdfunding was to stay independent. Up to that point, we had never worked with a publisher and the process was foreign to us. We had also seen how well Double Fine and Red Hook had done with Broken Age and Darkest Dungeon respectively and decided to throw our hat in the ring. Unfortunately, Mighty No. 9 had soured the waters so we knew we'd have to show our work, which is why we launched with the demo. We had a lot of faith in our ability to make a good game and the demo would hopefully prove that. And it certainly did. After slowly growing a proven track record with the Turok remasters, Night Dive announced the System Shock Kickstarter in June of 2016, asking for $900,000 to create what was initially going to be a pretty faithful remake in terms of mechanics and level design. The problem was the Kickstarter was a bit too successful in that it smashed that goal very early on and would eventually go on to accumulate $1.3 million by the campaign's end, something the team weren't necessarily expecting. To give fans even more options, it was decided, mid-campaign, to add PS4 and Xbox One ports to the stretch goals, which, while making a ton of sense at the time, would lead to some pretty serious issues. Unity was initially chosen as the engine that would power the remake, which was perfectly fine for their needs as it was simple to program for and fairly versatile. The problems came, however, when they quickly realized that it was not yet optimized to run very well on consoles in 2016, so to keep everything in parity and for the long-term betterment of the project, Night Dive made the decision to switch to Unreal Engine 4. Now, I know, I know what you're gonna say. Hey, that's the exact same decision which fucked up Jaeger's Dead Island 2. Well, yes and no. If you'll recall, Jaeger started working with UE4 in 2013, where knowledge of its programming ins and outs was very much in its early stages. And moreover, System Shock was never going to be open world. Much like the original, it was designed to be a tight, claustrophobic experience. Night Dive then had to hire a number of new programmers and artists who were more familiar with UE4, but when they and the initial Unity team started to collaborate, there was a bit of a disconnect. 
A new art director was brought in who unfortunately wasn't a fan of the clean look that was seen in the Kickstarter demo. These disagreements eventually got to the point where the decision was made to start over from scratch, with everyone working towards a shared vision. I think to most, this seemed like a pretty reasonable course of action given the circumstances, but Stephen Kick admitted it actually resulted in way more issues. At this stage, our original prototype team began to leave the project. This is when I should have stepped back in and made the necessary decisions to write the ship, but we had made such a dramatic investment in hiring the new UE4 team that I believe starting over yet again would have been catastrophic. I had been assured time and time again that this new team would deliver and I had no other choice but to trust them. And while the team did deliver, it was unfortunately on something that started to differ from the demo that the Kickstarter had originally launched with, approaching more of a reboot or reimagining rather than a faithful remake. Periodic development updates throughout 2017 started to garner harsher and harsher reactions from backers, which caused a rapid decline in both morale and workflow. Feature creep also started to rear its ugly head, which if you're not familiar with, is a design phase where so many new features and improvements get added so quickly that it becomes untenable to support them all and actually starts hindering progress. And progress very much started to be hindered on System Shock. So much so that Steven Kick decided to step in and officially hit pause on the project so the team could reassess what they had, what they needed to do, and the best way to move forward. One of the things they realized was that for the amount of work that still needed to be done, the remaining budget wouldn't suffice to do it. And unfortunately, Night Dive wasn't able to generate interest from any publishers to help fund the rest. Steven's public statement to backers had called this phase of development a hiatus, a term that he since regrets using, as it carries a more negative connotation than what was intended. Somewhat predictably, a vocal portion of fans took this news a little less than elegantly. Those first few weeks after the hiatus were some of the most difficult of my life. I received multiple death threats. Night Dive was reported to local authorities in Washington and Oregon on fraud allegations, and at one point, a number of backers attempted to file a lawsuit against us. Regardless, failure was never an option for Night Dive, and slowly we began building momentum and rebuilding the trust from our community. We live streamed development as often as we could and fielded questions from our backers. Any opportunity we had to show transparency, we took, because above all else, we wanted everyone to know that we were still working on System Shock, and we would fulfill our promises. So, how would they go about fulfilling those promises? Yep, you guessed it, a complete project reboot. Uh, again. As if there hadn't been enough already, another unforeseen issue which really didn't help matters was the fact that at the very same time Night Dive were working on their System Shock project, Warren Spector, the original producer of System Shock 1, was working on his. With the IP under their control, Night Dive licensed it out to former Looking Glass co-founder Paul Neurath's Other Side Entertainment to help re-establish the System Shock brand with not just a remake, but a brand new sequel with Warren Spector at the helm. This, as you can imagine, was a lot to keep track of for some fans. And when System Shock 3 imploded and was abruptly cancelled for reasons that are still not 100% clear, a portion of that fallout drifted over to Night Dive, as some fans actually thought the cancelled System Shock 3 was the System Shock 1 remake. Fortunately, even though Spectre's project failed to materialize, he was still very supportive of the work Night Dive were doing, and constantly gave feedback on their newest builds, which Steven cited as an absolute positive that helped guide the project. And part of that guidance led back to the team's original intention they had from the very start, a measured, authentic remake that stuck as close to the source material as possible, only updating what needed to be updated. Profits from some of Night Dive's other releases like Blood Fresh Supply, Doom 64, and Shadow Man Remastered, as well as striking a publishing deal with Prime Matter, would fund the rest of development, so there was that at least. But as long as nothing disastrous happened in 2020, the team were confident they'd be able to ship by the end of that year. 
Ah, yes. COVID-19 caused a number of delays, as several employees working from home were laid low for weeks at a time, but that wasn't even the worst of it. Many others on the team were moonlighting on System Shock, meaning they were working day jobs at other studios, which often isn't an issue as long as neither project affected the other. However, three specific employees that have been essential to System Shock happen to be working at a studio that Epic, makers of the mainstream blockbuster phenomenon One Must Fall, suddenly up and bought, and because of their non-compete clause, were barred from working on anything else. Night Dive thought since they themselves were an official Unreal licensee, Epic would cut them a little slack and allow said individuals to continue their work, which was met with an enthusiastic fuck off. I don't recall saying good luck. This greatly contributed to the delays seen through 2020 to 2021, as they scrambled to find other experienced staff members who could do the same specialized work, which obviously was a big to-do. After that had been finally settled, the team also felt they needed one last step back to see where they were. One of our missed release dates was due to us looking at the game long and hard and just deciding we needed more time. Could it have been released then? Yes, but it would have sucked. We had already invested an immense amount of time and money into the project, so we had to bite the bullet and give it the extra time in the oven it needed. That pledge of transparency Steven mentioned earlier was also maintained, as another demo was made publicly available, which very clearly showed the renewed focus and attention to detail the team were working towards. After a few more tiny delays here and there, there's always a few, the System Shock remake finally released on the three major PC storefronts on May 28th, 2023, eight years after development had officially started in 2015. While the console editions are forthcoming, it can't be too easy to translate all the commands and control options over to a controller, the PC version thankfully achieved plenty of glowing praise from various outlets, as well as an enthusiastic fan response, something Steven is very thankful for. It doesn't feel real. I've been dreaming about this game for the past 10 years, and I almost don't believe the review scores and the comments I see from fans. All we wanted to do is make a fun game that lived up to the legacy of the original System Shock, and it appears we've done it. What seemed like an impossibility for so long has finally come to be, and I couldn't be happier with what my team accomplished. In fact, most of the negative reviews stem from the remake not updating some of the more obtuse elements from the original, which proves you really can't please everyone, as when you come down to it, we're all pathetic creatures of meat and bone, panting and sweating as we run through life, hopelessly trying to challenge an immortal machine. And if you know of any other projects that were born from the fruits of so much imagination and labor, do let me know in the comments below, or enter the gore-filled steel hallway that is my Twitter. See you next time! Hackers! And thanks for watching!